Let's begin tonight by looking back at uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because we've spent uh, time here in the last couple of Wednesday nights. But uh, what we understand here is over uh, the last, uh, really over the last uh, many months now, uh, we've been uh, doing a topical study on the Word of God. Uh, Some words about the Word. Now uh, we have mentioned several words about the Word. And uh, I hope this has been beneficial in your study about the Bible itself. It's been beneficial to me to just take time and comb through these verses and see uh, what the Lord would have for us in different lessons concerning uh, the Word of God. Uh, the last lesson that God gave me to preach to you as we've, uh, we have uh, given this study has been uh, the one that I introduced a couple of weeks ago, and that is uh, that when we have God's Word, we have something that we can trust more than our own experiences. And uh, if you'd be honest with yourself and I'd be honest with myself, we spend a whole lot of time trusting in our own experiences. Amen. It is our experiences in life that uh, truly do shape and mold how we think and how we act and how we respond. It is those experiences that uh, are embedded down deep inside of us and cause us uh, to do the things that we do, to respond to the circumstances in life, (coughs) excuse me, the way that we do. And so uh, the Word of God here is telling us that uh, that is, while that is natural and why it, while it is understandable, uh, it is not what God would have for us. Amen. Uh, God does not want us trusting in our own experiences more uh, than what His Word has declared. Now, if what you have experienced goes along with His Word, you can trust that experience as long as it goes along with His Word. But it's in those moments where uh, God's Word says one thing, but experience says something else, and now there is a conflict within the heart and the mind of a believer where God wants us to trust him by faith and trust this book of faith that he has given us from him. Amen. And so here in 2 Peter chapter number 1, we find out in these last few verses of the chapter uh, that Peter has been uh, giving that, uh, introducing that about he is a man that has had many experiences, wonderful experiences, uh, one-on-one personal experiences uh, with the Lord Jesus, even uh, probably one of the greatest moments in the earthly life of the Lord, and that was that Mount of Transfiguration experience where Jesus was transfigured uh, before them in Matthew chapter uh, number 17. And they saw him as he would return uh, one of these wonderful days. Amen. Uh, Verse number 16 said that in that moment they were able to be uh, eyewitnesses of his majesty. They were able uh, to uh, receive from God honor and glory. They were able to hear the voice of God uh, coming from what he says, the excellent glory, uh, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he gives that experience, but then states to us that in the word of God, we have something that is more valuable than even his Mount of Transfiguration experience. And I would mention tonight that if it is more valuable than Peter's experience, there with Christ on that Mount of Transfiguration, no doubt that the word of God is more valuable than any experience I've ever had, any experience that you've ever had. Amen. And that's why, and I know it's amazing, but you think about our experiences in life, uh, the Word of God's above all of those, and they pale in comparison to what's in the Bible. But then any experience you have with God, uh, we don't try to explain. We just say those experiences with God are things that uh, cannot be explained. Amen. And so here we find the Word of God more valuable uh, than uh, our human experience and our human thoughts on life. And so uh, we began to talk about uh, what we must do according to the Bible uh, when it comes to those moments. We are uh, to trust the Word of God over our own experience. And our relationship with God is one of trust. And then uh, this is where we were over the last uh, couple of Wednesday nights just talking about uh, that when we trust the Word of God over our experiences, we must do so first of all within the realm of our doctrinal stand. And if you remember, I gave uh, over those two Wednesday nights, we spent a good bit of time looking as an example uh, that we see prominently in the Christian world today, and that is over the issue of speaking in tongues. How they will say, this is what I've experienced, this is what I've seen, and I don't really care what you'll show me from the Bible, I know what I've experienced. So when it comes to the doctrine we believe, 
believe. The teachings that we stand on, we stand on uh, what the Word of God says. When our doctrinal stand, we've got to make sure that we trust the Word of God over our own experiences. Now, uh, look with me again tonight at Proverbs chapter number 3. Not only should we trust the Word of God over our uh, uh, over our own experiences when it comes to our uh, doctrinal stand, but I'll say this, we should trust the Word of God over our own experience when it comes uh, to our decisional selections. Not just our doctrinal stand, but our decisional selections. Notice what the Bible says here in Proverbs chapter number 3. The Bible says this in verse number 5, Trust in the Lord, and I know I preached on this, and I made uh, several applications uh, about Christian graduations out of this, and uh, trusting in the Lord uh, to get saved, trusting in the Lord with day-to-day decisions in life, and then trusting in the Lord when we leave this world by way of death. But notice what the practical understanding here of this text is. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and uh, depart uh, from evil. In life, you and I are going to be called not only to make doctrinal stands, but we will uh, be called to make decisional selections. And what I mean by that is every person in this building, even whether you do it consciously or not, all, every day of your life, all day of every day of your life, you are making decisions. Amen. When we come into church, and I know we say this a lot, especially as preachers, we say it to the lost, we say it to those uh, that are saved. You may come into church and say, well, I'm just going to come and I'm going to sit and I'm not going to make uh, any decisions. The problem with that is you just made a decision. If you come into church and your laws and you say, I'm not going to get saved, I'm not going to make a decision for Christ, guess what you just did? You just made one. You didn't make the choice to receive, but you did uh, make the choice to reject. Amen. Indecision is a decision. Amen. Uh, I heard it said before uh, that to, to uh, fail to plan is to plan to fail. Well, and for you to uh, fail to make a decision is to make a decision to fail. Amen. And that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, you are making a decision that is wrong. Here we find in the book of Proverbs that uh, the Bible has something to say to us uh, concerning the decisions that we make concerning our suppositions. Notice the Bible says here in verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And notice this now. Why do I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart? What is What else do I need to do? He goes on to say, And lean not unto thine own understanding. When it comes to the decisions that we make in life, we all have our own understanding. We have that, as I've already mentioned, that understanding that we have that is based upon the experiences that we have all already uh, experienced in life, and we oftentimes will make decisions based on that understanding. Uh, we may have uh, uh, understanding about things that we've inherited from others. We've seen uh, so-and-so, uh, they acted this way, they taught me this truth, they taught me this uh, lesson, or whatever the case may be. Part of our understanding is influenced by others, whether uh, for good or uh, or not so good. Amen. And so uh, we there's so many different ways that we come uh, to receiving the understanding that we have but friend if our understanding is not received through what the Bible says then there's a problem with our understanding Amen. here the Bible says don't uh, the key to this verse here is in verse number 5 where he says thy own thine own understanding God's not interested in what I think I understand, but what is truly to be understood in the reality of the world that we live in. And you will not find true understanding and true knowledge apart from the Word of God. And so we have these things that we have as suppositions in life. Well, I suppose this is the right way. I suppose this is the right way uh, to respond. I suppose this is the right direction to take. Amen. Amen. And if our steps are not ordered by the Lord and we're not going in His direction, our suppositions will lead us to a mess. Amen. And so here the Bible gives us warning uh, to trust in what God has, to trust in the Lord with all of our heart, to not lean on our own understanding in all of our ways, all of the direction in life. We are to acknowledge Him and He shall direct 
thy path. God doesn't want us to go with our own understanding, but rather with his direction. And the greatest way you'll find direction in life is through the word of God. The psalmist said this in Psalm 119, 105. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, God, your word, that lamp unto my feet shows me where I am. That light unto my path shows me where I'm going. Without the word of God, I don't even know where I am. Amen. When it comes to life and when it comes especially to the Christian life, without the word of God, I don't even know my standing before God. I don't know where I am. But I'm telling you this tonight, without the word of God, I don't even have a clue where, not only where I am, but I definitely don't have a clue where I'm going. It's the word of God that gives us our direction, our decisional selections concerning our suppositions, how to make the right decision concerning what we suppose, what our own understanding is. But then, look with me please tonight at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I've got several things to say tonight, and I'm, going to do, I'm doing my best to get through several of these points tonight. And uh, I want us to be done with this study on part 20. Amen. And so we're going to do that. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. With the help and the grace of God and a good supportive congregation, we're going to do that tonight. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. You all know the verse, verse number 7. I believe it's a verse that every Christian should have committed to memory. It's something that we should have as a mantra of how we live, if I can uh, use that for God. A, a slogan that oftentimes we should remind ourselves. And by the way, it is something that will be greatly encouraging in life if you'll let it be. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Here, This is a parenthetical note. He says, Herefore, we walk by faith, not by faith sight. Now this verse here tells us not about our suppositions but it tells us about the, the decisional selections concerning our steps. Our steps. For we walk. That sounds like steps to me. I hope it sounds like steps to you. Amen. The steps that we make in life, not just how our suppositions, what we should do when we think one way and we understand things on our own. But before we make that first step, how are we to make it God's way? Well, we just saw in Proverbs, we're not to make it by our own understanding. We are to make it by God's uh, giving us direction. He is the one that directs our steps. But how is God? going to direct our steps. He is going to do it within the realm of the faith of a believer. If you're going to take steps with God, you're going to have to take steps by faith. God has called his children to be people of faith. We became children of God by faith. Amen. Yes, it's by grace, but it's by uh, faith. Amen. And so we understand you don't even become a Christian set by faith. So how can we live as a Christian? If it's void of faith. Here he says we walk by faith. Not by sight. Now it is interesting to note. <coughs> tonight that this is a parenthetical statement. In other words it's inside of a set of parentheses. Which simply means that this is a part of this text. That uh, you could remove. It is a description of what is going on. Uh, in uh, the scriptures around it. The context here of what is being said. In chapter number 5 really goes back uh, to chapter number 4. And in chapter number 4, the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Corinth, he is speaking to them to about their ministry uh, as believers. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. And so he is telling them about their ministry for God and how it's a ministry they can afford to get weary. They can afford uh, to slow up and to quit. This is a ministry they've received mercy from the Lord and so therefore they uh, should not fade. He talks about the gospel in verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. We as believers cannot afford to slow down on the ministry of the gospel and living out the life of Christ and being the hands and feet of Christ extended to this world because if the gospel is hid, it's hid to those that are lost. It's hid to those who need it the most. It's hid to those that will go to hell without it. We can afford uh, to live like luster Christians.
Christian life's left the gospel uh, be hidden. And so the context there, he is speaking about the ministry we've been given. He's talked a little bit there in verse number 8 about some things to expect in the ministry and some things that Paul and them had encountered in the ministry when he said we're troubled on every side yet not destroy us. We are perplexed but not in despair. By the way, all of these verses makes real good preaching. Amen. I just don't have time to do it tonight. We are troubled on every side yet not distressed. You got God, you don't have to be distressed. Amen. Though troubled on every side. We are perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. In other words, that's part of the ministry of a child of God is that the ministry of Christ, that the death, the burial, the resurrection, the resurrected life of Christ be manifested in our life for him. Amen. And so he begins to talk about this ministry, begins to talk about what the ministry of Christ had meant to him. He moves forward uh, there in verse number 16, uh, talking about, uh, he says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment working for us a far, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, in the ministry that we have for Christ, there is a finish line. There is a goal. There is something for us to look forward to and to keep on pressing toward without fainting. Amen. With that being said, he moves there in the context here to chapter number 5. He says, for we know... He's just talked about the temporal versus the external and how we're pressing toward the eternal. He says here, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, talking about our bodies, if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I think every child of God can say amen to that tonight. Amen. For in this we groan earnestly desiring, talking about in these temporal bodies, talking about with that expectation in mind, for in these earthly bodies we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from above. If you're saved by the grace of God, living in this uh, temporal world, and you see how these bodies are not meant to last forever, you have a loved one whose body's failing them, and you're going by, you're, you're, you're moving forward in life, and you find out uh, that the living in life really isn't everything uh, that it's chalked up to be. Amen. That it's not always enjoyable. Amen. And these bodies really are temporal. It'll cause you to uh, to long for and to earn for, uh, uh, to, to yearn rather uh, for the day where you can t- p- shed aside all of the temporal uh, bindings of this world and go to an eternal land and enjoy the eternal blessings that we have in Christ. Amen. He said, for in this we grow grown earnestly desiring uh, chapter 5 verse 2 to be clothed upon with our with our house which is from above if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked for we have we that are in uh, this tabernacle do groan being a burden and I think we all know what it's like to face the burdens of life amen not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that morality uh, that morality might be swallowed up uh, of our mortality rather might be swallowed up of life. Verse number 5. Now uh, he ha- he that hath uh, wrought us for the self same thing as God who also hath given us the earnest or the down payment of the Spirit of God. When God put the Holy Ghost in you at salvation he was simply making an earnest payment. He was making a deposit uh, on, uh, on what he had purchased you to be in the future. Amen. I, I like what Brother Sidney Weaver said while he was here uh, talking about our relationship with God. He said we are bi-locational. Amen. Not bi-vocational, but bi-locational. Amen. Which means we are here at home in these bodies. Yet the Bible says that we are already seated together with Christ in heavenly 
places. I'm here and I'm there and one of the days the me that is here will one day be to meet up with the me that is already there. Amen. That positional truth. Amen. Versus uh, that positional truth in the Word of God meets our practical uh, reality down here. Amen. And so here he reminds us of that fact. Amen. That Christ when he saved us paid a down payment uh, for us. Amen. That we could enjoy all of those blessings in Christ. Verse number 6. Therefore we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we are present from the Lord. Excuse me. Absent from the Lord. While we are at home in the body we are absent from the Lord. And so here he says in verse number 6 when he says therefore we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from the Lord. That is an understanding. That is something that the children of God know to be in these bodies in this world we are not physically uh, present with the Lord it takes death for that separation to take place and so therefore while we long for that day and we yearn for that day where the temporal will meet up with the eternal when the mortality will be shed off and we will get to enjoy the immortality in between those two moments while we are walking in this walk with Christ in this journey down here in the temporal in this world and long for that other world we must walk by faith and not by sight faith says I'm here but I'm headed over there Faith says, I am, uh, Christ is in me here, and I am in him. And one day, because of that, I will, although I'm physically absent from his uh, presence in terms of a physical face-to-face -face, relationship with Christ, at this point, faith says, one of these days, I'm headed that direction. So while I'm here, I must walk by faith. I must be faithful. I must not quit. I must fulfill the ministry that God has given to me and that he gave to me at salvation to walk with God to serve him by faith to not quit to not give up to not let the gospel be hid amen lest it be hid to those that are lost and to go on and to walk on with God confidently even though there may persecution come we need to realize that because of Christ we're not going to be forsaken we may be cast down but we don't have to be in despair it may be bad down here but Christ is with us every step of the way and so along this journey until we get over there, we must walk by faith and not by sight. Sight. When we walk by sight and we walk by what we see and how we feel and all of the things that our senses bring to us in life, we'll be tempted to quit. We'll be tempted to fall short. We'll be tempted to lay our Bibles down and just indulge in, in the flesh and things of this world when the going gets tough being a Christian. To be satisfied with just being on your way to heaven and not living a walk, a step by step by step walk with Christ. To stay right here where you are and never take another step forward with Christ. I'm telling you, there will be times, dear friend, where life will put the pressure on. There will be times where life itself will bring the burdens and they will pile on. And you'll have some of those experiences that we mentioned on Sunday where it just seems like when it rains, it pours. Those things will happen. But Christ has called us to trust in what this King James Bible says over anything that we feel, anything that we think we understand, anything that the experiences of life bring our way. We are to trust in God and keep on walking and keep on stepping by faith because thank God we're headed to a world where it all will be set straight one of these days. He gives us in the Word of God truth concerning our decisional selections, concerning our supplications, concerning our steps. I'm not going to take time to preach that third one. Let's move on tonight. Amen. He gives us, uh, tells us in the Word of God that we must trust in the Word of God over our experiences when it comes to our doctrinal stand, when it comes to our decisional selections. Number three, when, when departures sadden. Go with me tonight real quickly. Brother Lewis did such a good job preaching on this just the other day. So I'm not going to take time to preach on it much. But go with me please tonight to John chapter number 11. <clears throat> John chapter number 11. While y'all are turning, I'm going to get a drink of water. 
I'm trying to cover a lot of ground. I'm doing it pretty quick, and I'm wearing myself out doing it. Amen. At least my voice out anyway. John chapter number 11. Here in this passage, we find a passage that while it is heartbreaking in the terms of what we see taking place here in this chapter as Jesus and several of his friends are burying another, another one of Jesus' close friends by the name of Lazarus, we do find a great example concerning what Jesus would have to tell us and remind us of concerning death. And when, when departures in life, the departure of friends and family and loved ones, when they leave this world and they depart for, uh, the, they depart for the next world, those moments when it saddens us, this passage gives us a great example. Think about what the Bible says here. I believe that we are to trust the Word of God even when departures sad. And everyone knows the context here. Lazarus has died. Jesus comes to the tomb. Look at verse number 4. Notice this. In the moment of this death, we know verse 1, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, notice what he said now, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now let me ask you this question without having to read a whole lot of verses. Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. Was that true or not? Did Jesus lie to them or not? From the worldly standpoint, we would say, but Lazarus died. Here's the issue though. And yes, everybody, thank you for being more spiritual than most. Jesus did not lie to them. Here's the issue. Mary and Martha, hearing that, might have been tempted, or those around uh, might have been tempted that heard that, the disciples and others who may have heard uh, Jesus say that when he said this sickness is not unto death, and then Lazarus dies. They might be tempted to say, well, apparently the Lord got that one wrong. Those that would have heard Lazarus say that didn't have the same knowledge that Jesus did. That, my friend, is where you and I get mixed up in trying to go our own way and go on our own experiences and these things that I've already mentioned to you tonight. We don't have the same vantage point as Jesus does. We don't know all that Jesus is doing. By the time you get to the end of this story, guess what? Lazarus may have died, but he did not stay that way. So therefore, was that sickness on to death to where Lazarus would be dead and the sickness has had the victory? Absolutely not. He didn't stay that way. When Jesus said it is for the glory of God, was he telling the truth? Absolutely. Je Jesus allowed Lazarus to die so in the moment of his resurrection he would be truthful in the first half that it wasn't on the death, but then also truthful in the second half that God's the one, only God gets the glory. When Lazarus is raised from the dead. Here we find verse number four, that statement. Jesus has stated his word, and if they were not careful, they could have been tempted uh, to, uh, to doubt what Jesus had said. Look with me at cha not only chapter number 11, verse four, but let's look at chapter number 11. Look at verse number 11. Notice the Bible said this, these things say, said he... And after that he said unto the, saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. <coughs> then said his disciples, <coughs> excuse me, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. <coughs> I think all of us know that if, if you've got a sickness and you sleep it off, you usually end up doing better. Amen. He said, if he sleep, he shall do well. Look at verse uh, number 13. How be it Jesus spake of his death. 
But they thought that he had spoken of taking, uh, the taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent he may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Jesus here has stated some more words. He has told us that Lazarus, what Lazarus' sickness would not leave him dead. But he tells them that Lazarus is dead. Now look with me at verse number 21. The Bible said, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now, let me just mention this. This is not just any Joe Blow off the street that's saying this to, to, uh, saying this to her, saying this to Martha. This is the Son of God that says, Thy brother shall rise again. They're talking about him being dead, and the Jesus says he'll rise again. He'll live again. And she's already said that she believes that if Jesus would ask anything of God, that God would give it to him. Notice what Martha, how Martha responds in verse 24. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Here's the problem. Mary and Martha are human just like us. They are fleshly, just like us. And, you know, you think about, and this encourages the fire out of my soul, amen, to think about these individuals are staring Jesus in the face, and they are having trouble with things that he tells them, and they're looking at him. Brother Gary, that doesn't make me feel, feel so bad when I've never seen Jesus eyeball to eyeball like they did, and, like they did, and sometimes I struggle. No doubt, sometimes you do as well. Here, people are staring Jesus in the face. Uh, face. He has showed up to their house. And they're still having trouble believing what he said. Sometimes the experiences of life will cause us to have trouble with even what Jesus has said. You say, what do you do? You just believe what Jesus said. You take one more step. You walk by faith and not by sight. You trust God over your own experiences. Their experiences said when someone dies, they stay that way. When someone is sick unto death, and we know the story, we know that it even came up, he's four days dead. Lord, by now he stinketh. If they're, now this isn't their natural speaking. Naturally speaking, if anything was going to be dead to save his life, it probably would have to be done before the decay process starts. Once that body starts the decaying process, that's a very good indicator there's no more hope for them. They know what life has told them. They know what their experiences has caused them to be conditioned to believe. But can I just remind you tonight, and I know this is simple preaching, and this is just plain thinking, but can I just remind you tonight, it doesn't matter what you have been conditioned to think. If you get Jesus in on the situation, there is nothing above his ability, beyond his ability to work in what you're going through. You get, I'm telling you, friend, it's, uh, I don't know, and I know we've said it before, and we've talked about it here in this church. I don't understand how people live life without Jesus. It is so good knowing that when I bow my head to pray, there's nothing I can do. I think about meeting with, I think about the call, uh, I think about uh, uh, praying with Miss Deborah this morning and spending time with her, praying with her. I'm telling you, there was nothing that I could do to help her in that surgery. I'll be completely honest, she wouldn't want me trying to help her in that surgery. Amen. I don't even hardly know what I'm looking at when I look under the hood of a car, much less the lid of a person's head. So, they don't want me rooting around in there. But there, I couldn't help her by putting my hands in and trying to fix things with that aneurysm. 
But Brother Jeremy, there was something I could do. And I did it this morning. I bowed on my knees. And I trusted in the Lord. And I prayed that God, and we prayed for several different things, things I knew she wanted prayed for. And we prayed that God would let her come out of that surgery. Let her let that let her head be fixed, let that aneurysm be fixed, and that by go of what only God could do, that she'd come out and be better off for it. I couldn't help. But what we did was we got Jesus in on what I couldn't do and what she couldn't do. We got Jesus in on the situation. And thank God we got a good report this afternoon. Amen. Here, there was nothing Mary or Martha could do to fix Lazarus. Too far gone. Sickness was nigh on to death, so they thought. But when Jesus showed up, and they got Jesus on the situation. Jesus is telling them that he is going to change it all for them. And even still, they had trouble believing him. I'm telling you, you say, preacher, why have you taken so many weeks to talk to us about this? Because us looking at the experiences of life, what we're conditioned to believe, the things that we understand naturally, that natural thinking a lot of times, even, even if we are the best of Christians and we know the Bible and we're faithful to church, if we're not careful, that natural thinking loves to try to jump up over what we know about God, over top of that spiritual thinking. I mean, I'm the pastor of this church, and even as a pastor, I fight that every day. As a Christian, you no doubt fight that every single day. And sometimes we just need to be reminded that when it comes to what we believe, our doctrine will stand. When it comes to the decisions that we make, and when it comes to these moments that are so heartbreaking, like something that's heart-wrenching, that'll just pull the ever-living life out of you as losing a loved one. Even though when we don't, what we don't understand... Thank God Jesus is able to do more. And His Word is truly able to comfort. And He is able to meet the need. If they would have been able to enjoy so much solace, if they would have just simply believed what Jesus said. When Jesus had already told them, this sickness is not going to be unto death. I'm going to get glory out of this. When Jesus looked at them and said, he shall rise again. Instead of trying to think about, well, I know he's going to rise in the resurrection. No, Jesus said he's going to rise again. Take him at his word. Believe what he said. Let's not try to be super spiritual. Let's just believe what God said in his word and let it minister to our heart. Amen. Trust the word of God over the experiences of life that bring sadness and grief and, and, and d depression and I'm not saying those things that not grieving is unspiritual by no means at all we see it here in the passage but friend God has given us something that can help us and encourage us and help us go forward in life even when departure sadden we saw this on Sunday morning I'm not going to take time to preach it tonight but you think about where we were on Sunday morning in Job chapter number 23 verse 1 through 12 where Job mentioned several, several times about the sorrow he was in and how he wished that he could just find the Lord and how he just wished that he knew where the Lord was. And he looked on this hand and that hand and looked every direction and he couldn't find God. But yet he said this, but, I, but thou knowest the way that I take. And when thou hast tried me, I'm going to come forth as gold. Here in that passage, we find that we can trust what God has declared and what God says, even in deep sorrow. We see that we can trust God's word over our, over our own experiences and our doctrinal stand and our decisional de uh, uh, selections when departure is saddened in deep sorrow. But then think about this tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. I promise I'm coming to the club to come to a close tonight. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter number 14. Everybody here is familiar with these stories. I wasn't interested in trying to jump off in some obscure Bible passages. I just wanted us to hang around some places we already knew and let God's Word remind us that there is comfort to be had. And there's strength to be had. When we put off what we think we know and the experiences of life and we trust that there is a more sure word of prophecy, when we cling to our Bible, God can help us in ways that we never thought imaginable. 
Matthew chapter number 14, verse 22. We all know it taking place here in Matthew chapter number 4, 14. In Matthew 14, uh, the Bible talks about these disciples. They are about to go into a very, very rough storm. Notice what Jesus said here. The point I'm giving you tonight is that we can trust in the Word of God over our own experiences in disheartening storms. Look at what Matthew chapter 14 verse 22 says. This is prior to the storm. Jesus said, and straightway Jesus constrained the, his disciples to get into a ship. In other words, he, them being in the ship, it was the will of Jesus Christ for them to be in that ship. He put them there. He, con, he constrained them to get in there. He literally is commanding this action. He tells them to get into a ship. And notice these words, and to go before him on to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Think about this now, and you can study the context if you want, just to, amen, be a Berean and make sure I'm not telling you wrong tonight. But what happens after verse 22, Jesus puts them in the boat and he sends them out into the water and very shortly they encounter that storm. Very shortly, it gets so bad that they think they're going to drown. They think they're going to die. They are terrified for their own lives. And they, I believe we could say, they are greatly disheartened. In Matthew chapter 14, what's going on? Why are we, why are we in this storm? We, we just enjoyed a great blessing from God. And here we are, we are fearful of our own lives. Remember, I mentioned how this very passage reminds us that we can trust the Word of God over our disheartening storms. These, and I, again, I'm not blaming anybody for the humanity that they have to fight every day. I have to, too. Amen. I'm not going to look down on these disciples, but if they would have just remembered the Word of Jesus Christ, they shouldn't have been discouraged in the storm. Because if you look at verse 22, what does he tell them? His command was, you're going to the other side. He said, I'm coming after you. You're going before me. He says, you're getting to the other side while I finish up some business here. While I send the multitudes away, I'm sending you ahead of me. There's two comforting statements in his words. Number one, you're making it to the other side. And number two, I'm following right behind you. How, how much blessings they uh, would have been able to, uh, that they missed out on just simply because they were just like us and very quick to forget what Jesus had just told them. Disheartening storms do not have to get us down and out. Do not have to get us to a place of hopelessness. Do not have to get us to the place where we lay our Bibles down and quit on the things of God. Or at least where we feel like it and we're tempted to. Why? Because we have the Word of Jesus. We have the Word of God. And we have the presence of God through the Spirit of God. He said, you're going to the other side. He already promised them that they're going to the other side. Can I remind you tonight that for every single one of us, we may feel like the storms in life are going to kill us, but Jesus has already promised us, friend, if you've read the back of the book, you know we are going to make it to the other side. Hallelujah. He's given us promises to rejoicing, promises to comfort us, amen, even in the storms. The last thing I'll give you tonight is... Not only should we trust in the Word of God over our experiences when it comes to our doctrinal stand, when it comes to our decisional selections, when it comes to uh, the moments when departure is sad, and when it comes to those times of deep sorrow, when we are in disheartening storms, but lastly, when we are, when we, when it comes to our devotional situation. You say, preacher. What are you talking about when you talk about our devotional situations? Well, simply this. There are some times when we as believers feel like everything is good between us and God. And a lot of times it's really not. When it comes to our devotional situation, when it comes to our relationship with God, there's so, I'm telling you as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, there have been so many people I've talked to through the years. You think if you do any kind of soul winning, of course, everybody in South Carolina is saved. We all know that. Amen. Or at least they tell us that. Amen. 
everybody's right with God. Everybody's got their own contract with God. They've got they've got something worked out uh, with the man upstairs. You know, I've heard it all. You've heard it all. There's a lot of people that think that when it comes to their devotional situation with God, when it comes to their relationship with God, to where they stand with Him, they think everything's all right. But the problem is what they are relying on to tell them that everything's all right with them and God has nothing to do with this book right here. You know how I know I'm right with God when I am right with God? You know how I know that I am? You know how I know I'm not right with God? I know that I am right with God or I'm not right with God based on what this book says. If all you go on is your experience or your, what you learned in uh, church or what you learned from so-and-so or what mom and daddy showed you, amen, or whatever it is, apart from the Word of God, you may think everything's good, but it really is not. There are so many people that tell us that they're right with God, that they tell us they're saved, that they tell us they have a close relationship with God, even in our Baptist churches, but they go about, uh, they go about their lives, but they don't go about it God's way. They are not in obedience to the Scriptures. And you cannot be in a place of close devotion to the Lord and be right with Him apart from what His Word says. And you'll never be right with God if the Word of God does not also agree that you're right with God. The Word of God over our own experiences. We've talked about what we must do. If you'll give me two minutes, I'll tell you why we must do it. Here's the reason why we must trust the Word of God over our own experiences. Because of what the Bible says in these verses. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You say, preacher, why do I need to trust the Word of God over my own experiences? It's because experiences change. Situations change. Feelings change. How we react changes. We may be one way today and another way tomorrow. As human beings, we are fickle people. But you know what's not fickle? The Bible. You know what does not change? The Bible. If you need to know how, what doctrine to stand on, how to make decisions in life, how to keep going when you're discouraged and despondent and depressed and the, your heart has been torn out of your chest. When it comes to moments like that, when you are in disheartening storms, how do you know how to respond? When you're concerned where you are in your relationship with God, how do you know? It's not by experiences that change and they're one way today, another way tomorrow. It is by what the Bible says because the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. It's not going to change. Psalm 19 verse 7 says the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. Not only should we trust in the Lord over our own experiences because the Bible does not change but it's because God's record is perfect. When the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. What that means is, is yes, it's not changing. But because it's not changing, it is a firm foundation for life. Experiences aren't. The Word of God is perfect. It's sure. It's steadfast. Experiences are not. So therefore, my encouragement to you, in this, for this last uh, installment of this series, as we have mentioned uh, several different things, 29 truths, I believe it's been on the Word of God. This last one I give is when it comes to the Word of God. Please know that when it comes to where you are and what you believe about the Bible, when it comes to decisions you make in life, when it comes to all those heart-wrenching scenarios of life, when it comes to sorrow and sadness and all those things, when it comes to where you are in your devotional situation with the Lord, let the Bible tell you how to go, what to believe, what to found your life on, where you are with God, because experiences will fail you, but the Word of God never will. 